What we have in DNA is akin to digital code. There are vastly more ways of arranging the characters in question that will generate gibberish than there are ways of arranging those same characters that will generate something functional. One of the greatest breakthroughs in the history of modern biology also raised one of the most profound insights into the very nature of reality itself. Well, welcome to One Life Network, everyone. I'm Brett, and I've been a pastor a long time. And at One Life, we are passionate about exploring cultural conversations from a Christ-centered worldview with people who believe and those who don't believe. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, please hit like and subscribe and uh, leave us a comment so we can build that relationship. Now on a Sunday special interview show, Ben Shapiro asked the bottom line question about why or why we should not view DNA as a signal of intelligence. Now Dr. Stephen Meyer, he's a Cambridge philosopher of science, gives one of my favorite replies to the issue. And Shapiro asks a great follow-up question. Now it's all super fascinating, especially when reflecting on the christ Center worldview. Check this out. Let's talk about information theory. So for folks who don't who haven't read your books, don't know anything about information theory. Why does information theory suggest that there must be some sort of designer? Obviously, people like Dawkins who suggest that, that evolution is the universal acid. They, they, they say that these things can arise by themselves. They would also make the suggestion that the information in DNA is not necessarily directed, that it only seems directed to us because we're here to actually look at the direction in which it moves. It could theoretically be random. What does information theory have to say well, about this Well, it's, it's actually helpful first to go back to the molecular biological revolution of the 1950s. Watson and Crick discover in 1953, they elucidate rather, the structure of the DNA molecule. They discover it's got this beautiful helix structure. They got the, there's these four chemical subunits that run along the interior of the helix called bases or nucleotide bases. In 1957, 1958, Crick, who was interestingly a code breaker in World War II, posits what's known as the sequence hypothesis, which is just a, a breakthrough moment in the history of biology, where he realizes that the nucleotide bases on the inside of the double helix are functioning like alphabetic characters in a written uh, language, or what we now think of as like the, the zeros and ones in a section of software code, which is to say it's not the physical or chemical properties of those bases that is important to their function, but rather it's their sequential arrangement in, a in accord with an independent code, which was later elucidated and we now call the genetic code. So what we have is a true information bearing system that is, uh, that is expressing information as it happens for building the proteins and protein machines that cells need to, to, to stay alive. So, um, in Seattle, where I live, we've got great information companies. We've got uh, Microsoft, which writes code. We've got Boeing and other manufacturing um, companies that use code. And there's a, a, a process called um, computer-assisted design and manufacturing, CAD-CAM, where an engineer might write some code, code would go down a wire, be converted into another machine language that could be read by a manufacturing apparatus, and that information will then direct the construction of a mechanical system. If you're at Boeing, it might put rivets exactly in the right place on the, on the airplane wing. So you've got, and the same thing that's going on inside the cell, that you've got information directing the construction of proteins and protein machines that are absolutely necessary for, for uh, survivability. So the big question is, where does that information come from? And also, what kind of information is it? And that's where the information theory comes in. Um, in the late 40s, there was a, a scientist named Claude Shannon who developed a mathematical theory of information. But his theory only captured, uh, it, his theory of information had to do with the reduction of uncertainty, which he showed was inversely related to, improb uh, to probability. More improbable an arrangement of characters, the more Shannon information that was carried. But his notion of information did didn't capture the, the, the notion of meaning or, or communication function. So you could have a, a series of characters that were basically gibberish, but because they were aperiodic and, and random, you couldn't really tell whether they were meaningful or not. But they had a big information measure. So Shannon didn't capture the difference between functional or meaningful information and just an improbable arrangement of characters. So it's actually not information theory, but it's information theory plus a qualitative judgment about what the sequence is doing that allows us to recognize the kind of information that we're familiar with in our own parlance. But the, the dictionary talks about variable sequences of characters for c conveying a meaning or a function. And that's what we have in DNA. And Fa Francis Crick was very clear on that from the beginning. He said, it's not mere Shannon information, it's information that's functional. And that's the kind of information that in our experience 
always indicates the prior activity of an intelligence. If it's and that's the muddy uh, statement that I, that is, I said was my favorite, that always indicates the activity of an intelligence. It has to do with meaning. It has to do with function that it's, it's communicating. It's not just communicating something. It's actually relaying something that it adds up to a teleological use. So uh, he goes on from here. This is great. It's just a, a random arrangement. Might be undirected processes. But if it's, if it's very specific and complex and it's operating in in accord with a symbol convention, then you've got information that is the product of mind. And so this is this is where we get into the theories of probability, because the question becomes, could there have been such a, a strand of DNA that comes about by chance? Because the theory, obviously, as you mentioned, of, of evolution suggests that it's mutations now in the DNA that create all of the change in human life over time. Right, so right, we'll right. skip the origin of life problem yeah, for just yeah, a second. Good, good, and, and, then, and, then, and then we'll, and then we'll yeah. but, but when it comes to the information string in the DNA, the contention is basically that given enough time, you run the experiment enough times, and eventually you will end up with an evolution that, and combined with natural selection, it preserves the mutations that are good, and you will end up with a something that looks designed, even though it is not designed. That mutation over time being preserved by natural selection is enough. Why doesn't that work? It's, uh, there's a mathematical problem, and it's a profound one. Um, my colleague David Berlinski calls it the combinatorial problem, or the problem of combinatorial inflation. Um, maybe simple analogy, way to get into it. We know from our experience uh, with software code, writing and, and, um, and using it, that the last thing you want in a section of functional software code is a, random, a series of random changes to those zeros and ones. If that happens, you're gonna degrade the information that's in that code long before you'll ever generate a new a, a software program or operating system. And um, Richard Dawkins and many, many other biologists have, have, have acknowledged that what we have in DNA is akin to machine code, or as Leroy Hood puts it, digital code. It's, the, it's functioning in exactly the same way. So what we've learned from software writing and using is highly relevant to understanding whether or not the mutation selection mechanism would actually generate, could generate conceivably or realistically new information. Um, and there's a, there's, there's a reason that changing software at random invariably degrades the information before you get anything useful and new. And that is because there's so many more ways to go wrong. In any, in any system of uh, digital or typographic or alphabetic communication, there are, there are vastly more ways of arranging the characters in question that will generate gibberish then there are ways of arranging those same characters that will generate something functional. So if you start randomly changing things, you're overwhelmingly more likely to find a gibberish se a sequence than a functional one. And as we've actually tried to quantify that, how much more likely, the, the quantitative odds are prohibitive. There's a scientist who worked for 14 years at, at Cambridge University, Douglas Axe, did his PhD at Caltech, went on to do a long-term molecular biology research postdoc at, at, at Cambridge to try to quantify this question. How rare or common are the functional sequences that would make a new protein or uh, a, a, new, a, a new gene capable of making a new protein? How, how rare are the functional ones in comparison to the non-functional ones? Good idea to look into Douglas Axe, by the way. That's a good tip, just to remember that name. And for a relatively short protein, about 150 amino acids long, he determined that the ratio of functional to non-functional sequences was about one over 10 to the 77th power. Now to put that in context, there are only 10 to the 65th atoms in the Milky Way galaxy. So what that means is that a random search for a new functional sequence is going to be like looking for one marked atom among 10 trillion, or uh, sorry, yeah, it'd be a t one trillion galaxies of the size of the Milky Way. So, uh, and what, what it turns out that even four billion years of life's history is not enough time to, to solve a search problem of that magnitude. And I go into all the math of this in the book and, and it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. There's only 10 to the 40th organisms in the history of the planet, not enough replication events to search a space 10 to the 77 uh, big. So you're looking at, even in the whole, if you take the whole history of, of life on the planet into account, you're only going to be able to search a tiny, tiny fraction of the total relative, re relevant sequences. So you got a really big haystack 
really small number of needles and very little time to look for them. The bottom line is it's overwhelmingly more probable that such a, uh, a search will, will fail than succeed in the known time of life on planet Earth, which means that the, the mechanism is more likely to, the, the hypothesis that the mechanism produced new information is more likely to be false than true. And so the result of this is, as you say, that it's more likely that it's, that it's designed than that it was randomly done in, in terms of DNA. And that's reflected in, in the fossil record in the extent, to the extent that there have to, there, there's sort of these jumps in the fossil record. And this is what you talk about in Darwin's Doubt, is that it's not a continuous process of, a, of mutation upon mutation building one on the other just randomly. It becomes a big engineering problem because it's not just that there's gaps in the fossil record. You have to ask, well, how would the evolutionary process produce all the new information necessary to build these completely new body plans? new cell types, new anatomical structures. And we know it, it would take a lot of new information. And so then you've got to look, well, um, is there enough time to do that? Uh, do you have enough trials uh, through this mechanism? And the answer is just overwhelmingly no. It's not plausible at all mathematically. And on the flip side, um, we do know, however, of a cause that is sufficient to produce new information. This is why it's not a god of the gaps or an argument from ignorance, is we're, we're drawing, and this is Darwin's historical scientific method. When you're trying to explain an event in the remote past, you want to draw on your knowledge of cause and effect. What kind of cause is out there that we've observed that is capable of producing the effect in question? And if the effect is a lot of new digital information, we know of a cause that can do that, and it's a mind or an intelligence. And it, ha it happens that that's the only known cause that can produce lots of new information, and it's certainly much more plausible than the Darwinian idea of a random search. And we show why mathematically it's much more plausible. This is not a God of the gaps um, argument. And, and as I've thought about intelligent design, more, what, what people have to understand is that it's not just kind of looking at something that's mysterious and saying, oh, God must have done it. It's actually going into what we know about intelligence, what we know about design, and what we know about what minds create and how we recognize it. So it's starting from that knowledge and working out. Um, for instance, like uh, if you were, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting today, if you were doing a search for uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, which it does go on, there's a SETI program. Well, what they do is they look uh, for what they call techno signatures. They, they, they look with radio waves throughout the universe and they're looking for particular kinds of radio waves being used out or being uh, picked up from the universe. But they're also looking for patterns that certain complex patterns would make it, if they did receive those, they would absolutely guarantee Guarantee there is intelligent life out there because intelligence has a signature. It has fingerprints. So we could absolutely know that. If a, if a, if a rover were going around on Mars, I heard lately that they, they found liquid water underneath the surface of Mars. Well, if they found something that... Um, uh, that looked like writing or certain complexities uh, on Mars, they could automatically know that there was intelligence on that planet at some point. Guaranteed. They wouldn't have to see it. They wouldn't have to know anything else about it, but they could absolutely guarantee that. Why? Because intelligence has a signature. And that's the entire idea behind the whole intelligence, uh, intelligent design markings. And that's why I always go back to the Christ Center worldview. We always have to remember that the Bible profoundly says that in the beginning was the logos, which was the Greek word for reason, for uh, logic, for the things we, we know of as intelligence. That was what was at the beginning. That came first, and we find that infused throughout the entire um, universe, and especially in living things. And I think that's a profound insight into the nature of reality that the Bible gives. So for more on that, if you want to hear from Stephen Meyer, and he has a couple of his friends that talk about this mathematical challenge, watch this. Hope that all helps.